Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Appreciate uh, the choir's work. Appreciate uh, all the folks who are serving this morning. I'm especially grateful to Ms. Jenkins and to the uh, SBBRC. I appreciate their support of the staff and um, vision. Grateful for, uh, for my friend, Pastor Williams, uh, who I admire his work so much and whose friendship I appreciate. Uh, greatly and uh, really feel honored to be able to um, bring uh, the word of God to break the bread of life to um, share from scripture with you all this morning. I do want to um, I do want to introduce my family, the part uh, who is with us this morning and so I'm just going to invite them to stand up. <laughs> Christina loves this part. She loves this part. But my wife, Christina. And then these are our twins. Uh, Wesley is a senior at Brubaker Technology High School. And uh, William, or Will, who is a senior at BTW uh, Magnet High School. And so uh, these are, yes. Fortunately, our two uh, older children were uh, off, in co- off at college. So uh, Brasher is in Nashville at Belmont University, and Phoebe is uh, at University of Mississippi and actually just returned yesterday because of uh, some duties that she had this morning. So we are glad to be a part of this family. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this church this morning. So uh, this morning, as we look into the Word, I'm going to be preaching a sermon titled Redeemed and Renewed. Redeemed and Renewed. We're going to be reading from Ezra chapter 3. This is a part of the story of God's people where they had been sent off into exile and they had been then allowed to return after 70 years. And when they got back to home, when they got back to Jerusalem and Israel, to the villages that they knew as home a long time before, this is what they did. And so this is Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled into their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. Somebody say unified purpose. unified purpose. Then Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, joined his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his family and rebuild, rebuilding the altar of the God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it as instructed by the law of Moses, the man of God. Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord each morning and evening. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning, we're going to be talking about renewal. And when we talk about renewal, it's not the kind of renewal that you have to go to like the uh, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles and sit in line for, right? That's not the renewal we're talking about. Or the phone calls that you get about, you know, your horn warranty going bad and your time to renew. It's not about that kind of renewal either. This is a different kind of renewal. This is the kind of renewal that allows us to feel anew in our sense of purpose and meaning for life. Isn't that right? That's the kind of renewal that we're looking for and that we're needing. It's the kind that renews our purpose and understanding of who we are. You may know the name Anthony Ray Hinton. Anthony Ray Hinton was wrongly convicted, uh, wrongly accused, wrongly convicted, and wrongly imprisoned for murder. He actually was sentenced to death, uh, spent 30 years in prison. And the entire time, he always knew he was innocent. He continued to seek his exoneration. And then, by the grace of God, in 2015, he was released. People came to their senses, understood what was going on, and uh, he was released. 
Since 2015, life is different than it was before he went in 30 years earlier. There's a deeper sense of gratitude that he lives with every single day. You can imagine that, right? A deeper sense of gratitude. Now, there are scars, right? The scars remain. He says that every time that he uh, gets out in his lawn to mow the grass, he is reminded of that traumatic experience of when he was first arrested, right? Every time he goes outside. So those scars remain, but mostly his life is defined by his purpose and what he wants to be about. Now listen to this. This is someone who spent 30 years in prison, wrongfully in prison. Someone who was facing his own death for something that he did not do. He wrote a book called The Sun Does Shine. And actually last summer it was adapted for a children's book. And recently in an interview, Hinton talked about those who had imprisoned him and took 30 years of his life. Listen to these words. I have to forgive them. Forgiveness is not about the other person. As I say, forgiveness is about you. They took 30 years from me. There's nothing I can do about that. But I am determined not to give them any, any of the joy I have. And I want to live the rest of my life until that day God calls. I want to be a light for people. How about that? After 30 years wrongfully in prison, he understood his purpose when he was able to get out as being a light for people. How about that phrase, light for people? That's familiar, isn't it? That brings us back to the Bible. That brings us back to Scripture. The story of God's people is that God had wanted them to be a light for all nations. From the very beginning, that's what he said to Abraham. And yet, we know that along the way, they kind of got off track. They were more interested in their own worldly power, those kinds of things. They had forgot their vocation. They had forgotten their purpose in the midst of all of that. And pretty soon, they found themselves out of their homeland. They found themselves kicked out of the land that God had given to them. So they were sent away. Their temple, the place where they had life together and community together, it was destroyed. The place that gave them meaning and understanding of their lives was taken from them. And all of this lasted for an entire lifetime, 70 years. How about that? For 70 years, the people of God were out of Israel, were out of Jerusalem, were out of the temple, away from this place. 70 years. 70 years. 70 years of displacement, 70 years of not being connected with the faith practices that gave them identity, 70 years of shame. I think about all the havoc that COVID wrought on churches and on faith communities. The time of no meeting in person. The time of on and off again meetings. That led to so much disconnection. So much pain. So much trouble. So much sorrow. During that time, many walked away from faith. A third of those in a study who reported regular attending church at least monthly have not returned to that same regularity. You know who they are too, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can look around and you can remember. right? Yeah, well, it's not just them. It's everywhere. And then, further... Of those who reported less regular attendance than monthly before COVID, only 6% report to have attended in person since then. 6%. How about that? And then I think about those who would have gotten connected but never had the chance because they couldn't step foot in the door. They couldn't shake the hand of the person who was there to greet them. Because the doors could not be opened. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of people losing a sense of purpose for all of this, right? Occupational changes, retired folks who had their schedule set, finding themselves a bit lost, even here a couple of years after 
the COVID experience. Young people missing foundations and missing communities. And that happened over just two short years, right? Two years. Imagine 70 years without disconnection. Imagine how lost we would feel if we were in that state for 70 years. Imagine what we would become if we were in that state. But how many know that God redeems God's people? Amen. Amen. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Tell me where would I be? And so the people of God uh, are allowed to return to Israel and Jerusalem. And this is the story that's told in the book of Ezra. And so Ezra 3 begins again in early autumn when the Israelites had settled in their towns. All the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. So when they were able to gather together, can you imagine how great that felt? They were reminded of their purpose when they came together. They knew what needed to be done when they gathered together back in Jerusalem for the first time in 60 years. Somebody say together. together. And so they began to rebuild the altar of God. That was the first thing, right? Let's get the first things first. We're going to worship the God of Israel. We're going to worship the God who saves. We're going to worship the God who redeems. And so they built the altar, began that process. And it says, even though the people were afraid of the local residents, do you hear that? They rebuilt the altar at its old site. So rebuilding the altar wasn't about throwing back to the good old days. You hear that? Sometimes that's what we want, right? We want to build something that reminds us of how things used to be. But for them, that wasn't the case. It wasn't just about putting up uh, an edifice so that they could remember what things were. Worship was central to their being light to the nations, to telling their neighbors about a God of covenant and love and goodness and power. It wasn't just about yesterday. It was about today, and it was about tomorrow for them. And they didn't know how everyone else would respond. They didn't know how their neighbors would take to this, them building that altar there. And yet, they pushed aside their fear to live into their calling. They pushed aside their fear to live into their calling Turn to somebody and say, you've got a calling. You've got a calling. And there might be obstacles. And there may be fears about living into that. But when God is on your side, what happens? Well, you can move through that. You can move through that through his grace. Dallas Willard is the author of a book called The Divine Conspiracy. He's a leading author in spiritual life. And I love the way that he talks about renewal. He talks about renewal in terms of the mind, the will, and the soul. He says, God calls us to heroism in the kingdom of God where we are perfectly safe to venture beyond all humanly reasonable limits and the following of Christ our Lord. Beyond all humanly reasonable limits. I love that phrase. All humanly reasonable limits. Because it's not humanly reasonable that followers of Jesus made it through the pains of persecution, is it? It's not humanly reasonable that a movement that started in little Montgomery began to reshape the world, is it? It's not humanly reasonable that this church, Metropolitan, continued to be a light after having its property taken a few years before, uh, wandering through the desert for a few years, and then settling in a house, right? It's not humanly reasonable. But living into our God-given purpose is never really humanly reasonable. Spiritual renewal isn't simply return to 
previous status. It isn't getting back to what we've known. It's about our future being made based on who we were created to be in Jesus. God isn't interested in his people turning back the clock to look like and to do things the way that we did just in 2019 before COVID. He's not interested in us turning back the clock to do things the way that they looked like or did in even 2009 or 1999 or 1989. God wants his church prepared for what it looks like to be light in 2029, right? In 2029. That's what God is looking for. Who's like me and ready for some college football? Yeah, we ready for some college football? So uh, Auburn has a new head football coach, Hugh Freeze. Uh, needed one, for sure. Um, he has been preaching, actually preaching, uh, from something that he said, calls flipping the script. Flipping the script. And we know that the script needed to be flipped over the last couple of years, right? Let me tell you how I have seen Metropolitan flip the script, all right? Do what was unexpected. Go beyond what was humanly reasonable. At a time when most organizations were still hunkering down during the COVID mess, you saw a unified purpose, you saw the needs of your neighbors. You saw the gaps in service. You saw ways for the church to be light in the community for not just your neighbors, but for all of Montgomery. It wasn't humanly reasonable that thousands would be fed out of the parking lot on Rosa Parks. But you did it, didn't you? It wasn't humanly reasonable that during a time when everyone else was shutting down programs that you would be adding programs. But you did it. You were rebuilding the altar. And you weren't rebuilding the altar just for yourselves, but for your neighbors and for all of Montgomery. And through, through media for, in fact, the entire nation. And that's why I'm here. I've been watching what you've been up to. And watching what you have done has inspired me and continues to inspire me. Seeing the way that you have shined light for all of Montgomery gives me hope. Gives me hope. And so I want to invite you to turn to somebody and say, we're not done yet. Come on. We're not done yet. When people find their purpose, they just can't be stopped. When the God-given purpose that he has for a group of people is found by that people, it doesn't matter how long the wilderness has felt like. He brings them to that purpose. So I'm looking forward, not just to 2024, but for 2029. Isn't that right? God's taking us on a journey beyond human, humanly reasonable limits. And you know that it starts where it started for Israel back in Ezra. It starts at the altar. It starts at getting the first things first, recognizing who is God the one who brought us together and the one who gives us our purpose and the one whose light we seek to replicate and shine wherever we go. So I'm going to leave you with this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Do not lean on your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Let's worship our God of light together. Let's be renewed together. Let us pray. Lord, in your generosity, you bring us together. You unify us, not just in body, but in soul. 
And you give us a purpose beyond what any single one of us might be able to do. We thank you for the story of steadfastness, for the story of faithfulness, for the story of those who respond to your call throughout the years. And we pray that we would find ourselves in that story too. That we would recognize our calling and step forward so that we might be light for the world. We acknowledge you before anything else. We acknowledge that you are the one for whom and with whom and because whom we do what we do. We give you thanks and praise. In the name of Jesus, amen.